Hi, everyone. Today's episode is guaranteed to keep you on your toes. I have three stories that will challenge your mind and keep you puzzled until there aren't any pieces left. You might even find that you're missing a few pieces. But first, cover up those toes and get them comfortable because they are about to be busy. But first, please tickle that subscribe button. Great. Now let's get into the stories. My name is Sarah, and I'm a nature enthusiast from Ohio. Last summer, I embarked on a solo road trip to explore the scenic beauty of the southern states. North Carolina was one of the stops on my journey, and little did I know that I was about to have an encounter that would leave me questioning the boundaries of what we consider real and unknown. It was mid-August when I arrived in the small town of Blackwood, nestled deep within the lush forests of North Carolina. The town had a charm that resonated with me, and its proximity to the Great Smoky Mountains made it an ideal base for my outdoor adventures. The locals were warm and welcoming, always ready to share stories about the wilderness that surrounded their lives. One afternoon, as I was hiking along a secluded trail, I noticed the forest had an eerie stillness. The usual chorus of birdsong had faded away, leaving only the sound of my footsteps on the path. A shiver ran down my spine, but I brushed it off as a trick of my imagination. As I continued deeper into the woods, the sunlight dimmed, and a sense of unease settled upon me. The atmosphere grew heavy, as if nature itself held its breath. I felt a primal instinct urging me to turn back, but my curiosity pushed me forward. A sudden rustling in the underbrush broke the silence, making me freeze in my tracks. My heart raced and beads of sweat formed on my forehead. I strained my ears, trying to discern the source of the disturbance. That's when I saw it. A flicker of movement in the dense foliage. My gaze fixated on the creature emerging from the undergrowth. It stood about six feet tall, towering over me with a primal grace. Its body resembled that of a large ape, but its features were distinctly different. Its limbs were elongated, covered in short, coarse hair that glistened under the dappled sunlight. Its head was rounded with a wide, flat nose and deep-set, intelligent eyes that seemed to study me. The creature's arms were long and muscular, ending in hands that possessed a haunting resemblance to human appendages. Each finger was tipped with sharp claws that glistened in the subdued light. It moved with an uncanny blend of agility and power, its steps silent as if it were gliding across the forest floor. Fear and fascination gripped me as I watched the enigmatic creature go about its business. It seemed oblivious to my presence, focused instead on foraging for berries and leaves. Occasionally, it would pause, its head tilting inquisitively, as if it sensed something I couldn't comprehend. Time stood still as I observed this creature this unknown being that defied all rational explanation. My mind raced, trying to process the enormity of what I was witnessing. What could this creature be? Was it an undiscovered species? Or perhaps a remnant of an ancient era hidden away in the depths of the forest? Eventually, the creature vanished into the undergrowth, disappearing as swiftly and mysteriously as it had appeared. Left alone with my thoughts, I retraced my steps back to Blackwood, my mind buzzing with a mix of awe and trepidation. When I returned to town, I shared my encounter with the locals. Some dismissed it as a mere figment of my imagination, while others nodded knowingly, acknowledging the existence of such beings beyond the realm of our understanding. To this day, I carry the memory of that encounter with me, forever imprinted in my mind. The enigma of that unknown creature in the North Carolina forest has left an indelible mark, reminding me that the world still holds mysteries waiting to be uncovered. And although my encounter lacked concrete proof, it reinforced my belief that there are realms of existence that remain hidden, silently coexisting with our own. In 1981, I was working as a Yellowstone park ranger, I was assigned to the Mammoth area of the park, which is located in northwest Wyoming. The area is very remote, and there are no roads leading into it. It was only accessible at the time by helicopter or horseback, so it was very hard to get help if you needed it out there. 
I had been working in that area for about two years when I began hearing stories from some of my co-workers about strange things going on at night around some of the backcountry campsites. Specifically, near Lake Village, which is located near Mammoth Hot Springs and west of Norris Geyser Basin, also known as the hottest geothermal basin in Yellowstone. One of my co-workers told me that he had been out on patrol one night and was riding his horse through the backcountry when he came across a campsite where there were two people apparently sleeping in their tent. As he approached, the tent flapped open and a woman popped out and looked at him for a few seconds, then quickly ducked back into the tent. He said she didn't say anything to him or make any noise. She just stared at him with wide, blackened eyes from inside her tent and began muttering something in a language he had never heard. He said he was so freaked out by this because he was convinced that she wasn't entirely human. As he put it, he could not explain it and understood that it sounded ridiculous, but he said there was just something really off about the whole thing, and his insides were screaming in the pit of his gut that he needed to leave. He also mentioned how there were these strange wooden hex-like trinkets, as he called them, hung up all around the makeshift campsite, and that the odor of rotting meat was so strong. He was so spooked by this experience that he just decided to leave and head back to Lake Village as fast as he could. After hearing that story, I began taking a closer look at the area around the campsites in the backcountry, and even noticed several more of these strange wooden trinkets hanging up on the trees in some of these sites. Some of them looked like they were made out of tree bark and had strange symbolism carved into them. It kind of reminded me of what you'd see in the modern-day Blair Witch Project. I didn't know what these things were, but I thought it was odd that people were hanging them up in the trees in the middle of nowhere. One night, a few of us heard some very loud and disturbing noises out in the woods near one of the campsites. It sounded like there was a group of people screaming, shouting, and lots of commotion all at once. But then there were also sounds underneath it, like animals howling and more commotion. I could tell that the horses were becoming frightened by this. So we grabbed our rifles and loaded up and headed to the area as fast as we could to go investigate. We would later come back to that site with a group of rangers and thoroughly investigate what had happened. We had found a large number of footprints near one of our camps where we had heard the noises. We saw everything from various bare footprints intermixed with animal prints. Upon closer inspection, the tracks appeared to be canine in nature and large. This could only mean one thing wolves. But this was 1981, so remember that wolves were not reintroduced into Yellowstone until the mid-1990s. Even more bizarre, these tracks were in sets of two or bipedal, and they also appeared to walk parallel with the bare human feet tracks that we found. None of us knew how to really explain what we found that night, and there were no other signs of anybody being there. I mean, there were no fire pits, no tents, nothing. We found more strange wooden trinkets that gave us this unsettling energy, as a few of us had put it. Going into 1982 is when we began to notice a substantial increase in bizarre, unexplained activity. I myself can only attribute this to occult activity and satanic rituals. There were other encounters reported by various colleagues of mine. More strange noises that could not be explained, more trinkets, and occult symbolism found in the backcountry. There were even possessed horses that would attack their riders, campers getting up in the middle of the night and vanishing without a trace. There was even a group of visitors during this time who were staying at Lake Village that reported waking up in the middle of the night to a strange, unearthly voice coming from near their tents. This was just some of what we were experiencing at the time. The voice appeared to be calling them out of their tents and attempting to lure campers deeper into the wilderness. What's most chilling about this is that the voice was different to all the campers we spoke to at the time. Some reported it sounding like a deceased relative, while others described the voice as familiar, but couldn't tell us much more about it. One particular event I remember happened to me and two other rangers when we went out during the spring of 1982 in the backcountry. We were going to check on a campsite where we had been having problems before. We were traveling by horseback and came across one of the strange wooden trinkets hanging from a tree out in the middle of nowhere. As we were going through this area, all of us felt something strange, like we were being watched. 
I thought it was just my imagination until the others began to speak up. When we finally arrived at the campsite, we found one of the missing campers tied up to a tree in the center of the site. He appeared to be alive, but looked like he had been severely beaten, naked, and was in a trance-like state, mumbling something in a foreign language that sounded ancient and had the look of someone who was possessed. We untied him from the tree, but he did not appear to speak English. So we brought him back to Lake Village with us, and after asking around, we found out his name was Kane, and he was from Russia. He told us that he didn't know how he had gotten there or what happened to him. In fact, he had no idea about even coming into Yellowstone. He would later disappear from the area a few days later, and we never saw or heard from him again. I've thought about Kame often over the years, and wonder if he was part of this bizarre activity that we were not only seeing, but experiencing. What was he doing out in the backcountry of Yellowstone, and what happened to him after that night? He was hardly ever reported missing, so I have no idea what became of him, but I often wonder if we had not found him at that campsite, would he have wound up like some of the other campers who vanished? We obviously have no answer for that, but I would like to think one. One of my co-workers was also attacked by one of his horses, which became possessed as he described and ended up in the hospital after he was thrown from it. He claimed that while he was riding back to Lake Village, the horse's eyes turned black and it began to head in the opposite direction of where he was trying to get it to go. After fighting with this apparently now possessed animal, he said his hand was jolted really hard and thrown off the horse where it trampled him. He said that the reins would eventually wrap around him and he was violently thrown onto the ground and then galloped off toward Lake Village at full speed after trampling him. This was the same day he had come into a large clearing and they had found these strange hex symbols, as he described, carved into the ground, almost looking like they were burned. He kept hearing this weird electrical buzzing on and off that reminded him of heavy machinery. Obviously, there was none because they were in the middle of the wilderness, but still incredibly eerie. And now that I look back on all of it, at the time, he actually broke several bones being thrown down and trampled on. But luckily, he survived. He even described how the horse's demeanor instantaneously changed. The horse perished a few days later under mysterious circumstances. These are just a handful of things I can remember off the top of my head after serving there. These events would take place for years to come and intensify going into the later 80s. One of my good friends, who also worked alongside me, had actually dealt with these occult activities face to face. He passed away in 2009 from cancer. God rest his soul. The stories were pretty terrifying. He told me of how he could see entities that were in the form of wolves and cloaked creatures, as he put it, just blazing ghosts like through the woods at night. He said everything would be illuminated as if there was a full moon out, and while they moved around and disappeared, it would go dark again. He would tell me that the dogs of the pack that he had would begin barking and howling angrily, like they were being commanded by one of these things. And one night, his own dog was trying to run in a different direction than he was following. Later on, he said his dog began looking closely at the tree line, as if watching something intently and starting to act funny. His dog had been around bears and mountain lions, etc., and never acted this way before. I have so many more stories to share with you. As always, I'll be in touch. My name's Jerry. I'm a retired high school biology teacher and have lived in Florida for 17 years now. Ever since retirement, I've dedicated most of my time to my small farm, growing my crops, and tending to my small chicken coop. It's a humble, peaceful life, away from the hubbub of the cities, the only noises being the intermittent cries of wildlife from the adjoining woods, the event I'm going to tell you about took place on the 15th of June, 2021. It was a usual evening. The sun had just settled, leaving behind a trail of soft amber on the horizon. After having my supper, I decided to take a quick stroll around the property. The lingering heat from the day had begun to dissipate, replaced by a more agreeable, cool breeze. Walking along the fence line that divided my property from the woods, I noticed that the usual cacophony of cicadas was oddly absent, replaced with a disturbing quietness that hung heavy in the air. It felt as if the woods was holding its breath. I stood there listening, 
trying to decipher the cause of this unnatural silence. Then I heard it, a rustle from the undergrowth, about 20 yards into the woods, too large for the usual raccoons or possums that frequented these parts. And there was an unfamiliar grunting sound, low and gruff. In all my years here, I had never heard anything quite like it. Curiosity peaked. I turned on my flashlight and shone it towards the undergrowth. What I saw froze me in place. A pair of eyes reflected the light back at me, but they were different from the ones I had seen before. They were larger, luminescent, with an eerie greenish hue and positioned quite high off the ground. The rustling grew louder as the creature moved, pushing aside the bushes with a brute force. And then it stepped into a patch of moonlight, allowing me a glimpse of its figure. The creature was about seven feet tall, with a muscular build. Its skin was a mottled gray, appearing rough, almost like the bark of an old tree. Its head was broad, somewhat humanoid, but with sharper features. The most striking were the large, luminescent eyes that dominated its face. There was a raw intelligence in them that sent a chill down my spine. It had a flat, almost non-existent nose, and a wide mouth that curled downwards in a grimace, revealing a row of uneven, yellowish teeth. Its arms were long, almost reaching its knees, ending with four-fingered hands, each finger capped with a thick claw. It stood slightly hunched as if its massive upper body was too heavy to carry. A crest of coarse hair ran from its head down to its back, stopping where a thick tail started, which swayed nervously as it stared back at me. My mind struggled to associate this creature with anything I knew. It seemed as if it had walked straight out of the ancient past, bearing elements from various creatures, yet not fitting any particular species. And then, as suddenly as it had appeared, it snorted, a huffing sound filled with an uncanny menace. It turned and retreated into the undergrowth, leaving behind a trail of crushed vegetation and a lingering sense of dread. I didn't sleep much that night. For weeks, I looked for any information on what I had seen, checking every wildlife database I could find, reaching out to old colleagues and local wildlife authorities, but to no avail. All I got were skeptical looks and theories about misidentified wildlife. I know what I saw that night wasn't normal, and I've not seen it since. But the memory of that encounter is etched deep in my mind, a testament to the fact that there are still mysteries out there in our world, even in places as familiar as our backyards. It was 1997, and I was working in Yellowstone National Park with the Forest Service. It was my first season there, and I was really excited to be spending the summer in one of the most beautiful places on Earth. I was also very excited to be working in a place that was known for its history of sightings of the supernatural. Because as you know, Yellowstone is a hotbed for all things strange and mysterious. As a child, I had always held a deep fascination for stories of ghosts and otherworldly creatures, and at one point or another, I was really hoping I would get to see something paranormal during my time working in Yellowstone. So, one night, I was on duty at the ranger station. It was a quiet night, and there wasn't much to do. I was sitting at my desk, going through my paperwork, when I heard a noise just outside. It sounded like something really heavy was moving around in the bushes. Curiosity got to me. I got up to go investigate, and as I approached the bushes, I could hear the noises getting louder and more distinctive. It sounded like either someone or something was breathing very heavily. But this something or someone was so deep in their voice that it sounded like they were a heavy smoker. I began to get scared, and I tried to stay calm to go see what was going on. Suddenly, out of the bushes comes this large, furry thing that was much taller than me. It had a huge head and appeared to have these sharp teeth. I was terrified, and I could not move. This thing just stood there and stared at me, and its eyes almost had this dreamlike quality to them, glowing red. Then it slowly began to move towards me. I quickly reacted, pulling up my firearm, and this thing seemed to look down and notice what I had done. It's almost like it realized what I was doing, because it very quickly changed its entire demeanor. 
It contorted its body in a strange way and almost crouched down and rolled sideways in a fast motion into the thicket beside me. At least, that's the best way I can make out what it did. Then, I hear it running at full speed, crashing through the trees, letting out this horrible scream that I'd never heard before. It was terrible, and this is all that happened in the course of probably ten seconds. But it felt so much longer. On one end, I was terrified to even breathe, and on the other end, I knew. Who could I possibly tell? So I radioed for backup and told them that I simply had seen a bear and that it had tried to attack me. I was scared, and I couldn't believe what had just happened. I tried to rationalize it and tell myself that it was just a bear, but I knew deep down that it was not. I knew that what I'd seen was something much more evil, something that I could not explain. Even now, I still can't recall exactly how to describe the feelings it gave me. I still think about that night sometimes, and it terrifies me still. I'm not sure what I saw, but I know that it was something supernatural, something that I never want to see again. I actually did my best to forget about that experience for a long time until I befriended a guy I worked with temporarily, who claimed to know a lot about Bigfoot. I never entertained the idea, but we began talking one day, and I shared my experience with him in a very vulnerable state and explained in detail what this thing looked like. He's pretty certain I encountered a gugwi. It was hideous looking and enormous. I was sure I was going to be killed. That's when he explained to me that they are known to inhabit the area surrounding Yellowstone and that they are usually very reclusive. He said that they are known to be very aggressive if they feel threatened and will often attack humans and eat them. I was so happy to have survived, but still haunts me to this day. Anyway, as someone who had worked in the forest industry in Yellowstone, I'd had my fair share of encounters with the supernatural anyway, and that one does stand out to me. I've seen other strange things like apparitions and shapes in the dark, but nothing compares to what happened that night. Anyway, let me know if you need anything. Thank you for all the hard work you do. My name is Jim Keller and I've been a Texas native all my life. I'm a single man in my early 40s working as a land surveyor, often covering hundreds of miles of terrain a week. The dusty plains, tangled woods, and craggy hills of Texas are as familiar to me as the back of my hand, or so I thought. The encounter I'm about to relate changed everything. It was mid-April a few years back, just before the sunset, when the Texan sky becomes a canvas of oranges and purples. I was up in the Panhandle region near Amarillo, surveying a large parcel of land recently purchased by a wealthy developer. It was a solitary job, and I loved it. I cherished silence and the bond I formed with the wilderness over time. But that evening, the tranquility I cherished was interrupted. The day had been unremarkably hot, and the setting sun was a welcome sight. I was packing up my equipment into the back of my truck when I noticed something out of place. About half a mile out, there was a small grouping of trees, and there was movement. From this distance, it could have been anything, but curiosity got the better of me. I grabbed my binoculars from the truck's cab. I peered through, adjusting the focus. It was larger than any animal I'd seen in this region, hunched over and dark against the dusky skyline. It was covered in a dense, dark fur or perhaps feathers, its body oddly elongated with disproportionate limbs. It was like a tall, misshapen man with an animal's gait. Its legs seemed powerful, bent in an unnatural way, and it had long arms that ended in what appeared to be claw-like appendages. I couldn't make out its face clearly, but there was a distinct glow, maybe eyes reflecting the dying light. I felt a chill prickle along the back of my neck. It was unsettling. For a long while, I just watched it, my curiosity wrestling with the primal unease growing within me. Then it seemed to freeze. I could have sworn it turned its head, looking straight at me. I was at least half a mile away, but in that moment, I felt seen, observed. I faced rattlesnakes, wild boars, even a mountain lion once, but nothing came close to the dread I felt then. I packed my binoculars, jumped into my truck, and sped out of there. The dirt road seemed to stretch forever, and in the rearview mirror, the silhouette of the trees grew smaller. 
That night, I barely slept. The image of that creature haunted my dreams. I wanted to talk about it, but who'd believe me? I'd be a crazy land surveyor, spotting monsters. I kept quiet, but the silence was a heavy burden. I started avoiding that part of the panhandle. The thought of running into the creature again, it left my guts churning. I dove into work using it as a distraction, but the encounter had altered my perception. The wilderness didn't feel the same. It was no longer familiar. There was a mystery, an unknown, lurking within it. After the encounter, I found myself reaching out to others more, seeking comfort in human company. I joined local gatherings, volunteered at the community center, and spent more time with friends. The loneliness of my job, once a cherished trait, now a reminder of that creature. As days turned into weeks, the memory of the encounter started to lose its sharp edges. But the world it revealed, one filled with undiscovered mysteries, stayed with me. Texas was no longer just my home. Every tree, every shadow hinted at stories waiting to be uncovered. My job as a land surveyor took on a new meaning. I was no longer merely documenting the land, I was exploring it, searching for what lies hidden in its heart. Sometimes when I find myself alone in the wild, a shiver of fear trickles down my spine, and I'm reminded of the creature, but with the fear comes a sense of wonder, a realization that we share our world with creatures unknown, living their lives parallel to ours, hidden in plain sight. My name's Jake. For as long as I can remember, I've been in love with the untamed natural beauty of Wyoming, where I've lived my entire life. I work as a forest ranger at Yellowstone National Park, a job I've held since I was 21, right after finishing college. My duties involve patrolling the park, ensuring wildlife and visitors alike follow the rules so that everyone can enjoy the pristine wilderness in harmony. This incident happened in the summer of 2018, during one of my routine patrols through the vast expanse of the park. The day had started off as any other. The sun was slowly making its way across the clear blue sky, and I was patrolling the southern edge of Yellowstone, an area teeming with dense forests and clear, bubbling brooks. As I moved deeper into the forest, away from the populated paths, I noticed an unusual stillness. There were no birds chirping, no sounds of squirrels or other small creatures rustling in the underbrush. It was as if the whole forest was holding its breath. Then I saw it. Near the edge of a clearing, partially obscured by the thick foliage, was a creature unlike anything I've ever seen. At first glance, it looked somewhat like a bear, albeit larger and standing much taller on its hind legs, approximately nine feet. However, its anatomy was quite different. Its body was covered in shaggy, dark brown fur, and it had a hunchback, making it appear as though it was perpetually leaning forward. Its arms were significantly longer than that of any bear I'd ever seen, ending in large, hand-like appendages tipped with formidable-looking claws. But the most striking feature was its head. It was elongated, almost reminiscent of a wolf with bright, intelligent amber eyes that seemed to glow in the dim light filtering through the trees. Its mouth was full of sharp teeth, but its facial expression didn't seem aggressive. Rather, it appeared as curious as I was. Our eyes locked, and I felt a primal fear that had nothing to do with logic. I was frozen in place, my breath hitching in my throat. We held each other's gaze for what felt like an eternity. Then. As swiftly and quietly as it appeared, the creature turned and disappeared into the forest, leaving behind nothing but the rustle of leaves and my racing heart. In the following days, I found myself unable to shake the encounter from my mind. I kept replaying the moment over and over, trying to make sense of what I had seen. I consulted field guides, combed through cryptozoology websites, and even reached out to colleagues, discreetly of course, but found no animal that matched the creature's description. It was as if I'd seen a myth come to life. The strangest part was I didn't feel any terror after the encounter. The initial fear had been replaced by a profound sense of wonder. I'd had a brush with something utterly unknown, something that wasn't supposed to exist, and yet it did 
at least for that brief moment in the quiet of the forest. It left me with a feeling of awe and respect for the wilderness, reminding me that nature still held mysteries beyond our comprehension. Since then, I've tried to find the creature again on my patrols, careful to respect its space, treating it with the same caution I would any wild animal. I haven't seen it again, but sometimes, in the quiet stillness of the forest, I sense it. Perhaps it's merely my imagination, fueled by the desire for another encounter, but it provides me with a newfound appreciation for my job and the vast expanse of the wild that I patrol. I still don't know what I saw that day, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is that I've had a unique experience that's changed the way I see the wilderness. It's a reminder that there are still things out there we don't understand. And for me, that's part of the magic of living out here in Wyoming, under the wide open sky.